Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Okay, hey everyone, check it out. You just saw the results of the church life assessment uh, from the church to bar. So now is your turn. CC Live uh, folks, we wanna hear from you. It's so good, it's so important for us to know what is going on in your life, in your spiritual life, and help us to minister to you better. So take the assessment. We got several ways to do this. You can uh, text this code to the, text, uh, to the number and you can do it on your phone. You can scan uh, your, with this QR code with your mobile devices uh, or you can just go straight to the link we're going to share in the chat room here soon but don't miss this chance to help us to know how things are going take the assessment only five minutes it takes five minutes to take the assessment answer a few questions and we're going to get connected thank you so much go ahead jump right there we'll be right back Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. 
At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. checked out our CC Live YouTube channel? It's the place to find all past sermons, as well as living room sessions, podcasts, CC Kids, and CC Students content. 
You can even use the search feature to look for specific videos on topics like marriage, finances, fear, heaven, parenting, baptism, and much more. Check it out today. And while you're there, make sure to subscribe. Okay, hey everyone, check it out. You just saw the results of the church life assessment uh, from the church to bar. So now is your turn. CC Live uh, folks, we wanna hear from you. It's so good, it's so important for us to know what is going on in your life, in your spiritual life, and help us to minister to you better. So take the assessment. We got several ways to do this. You can uh, text this code to the, text, uh, to the number and you can do it on your phone. You can scan uh, your, with this QR code with your mobile devices uh, or you can just go straight to the link we're going to share in the chat room here soon. But don't miss this chance to help us to know how things are going. Take the assessment only five minutes. It takes five minutes to take the assessment, answer a few questions, and we're going to get connected. Thank you so much. Go ahead, jump right there. We'll be right back. to have some fun and learn something new join us now for cc kids online community begins now welcome to cc kids live my name is miss heather and i am so glad that you are here today we are now in our Daring Faith series where we are learning about different people in the Bible who had incredible faith in God. Today's lesson is about Moses and how he chose to be brave in a situation where he could have chosen to be fearful. Let's watch. There once was a man named Moses who led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. 
the Israelites stood by the shore of the Red Sea, knowing that the Egyptian army was coming for them. And God spoke to Moses and said, Lift up your staff and stretch your hand out over the sea. The Lord opened a path through the water, and the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea with walls of water on each side. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the sea again. And Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the waters rushed back into place. When we worship, we can praise God for having such incredible plans for our lives and for being so good to us. We can thank Him for giving us the strength to be mighty. Stand up, friends. It's our time to practice our memory verse song, Ephesians 3.20. Just like Moses and the Israelites, we can choose to let go of our fear and be brave even in situations that may be overwhelming for us. We can always take comfort in knowing that God is always with us. Okay, are you ready to visit space again? Let's put on our helmets and let's check in with Commander Steve at Mission Control. Hi guys, well you see in our story today, Moses and the Israelites were stuck at the Red Sea with nowhere to go. But do you know why they were there? Do you know why they were afraid? Because they had just left Egypt and they had an entire army chasing after them. Now the Israelites, they were not trained fighters. They didn't know how to, de to defend themselves. And behind them was this massive army chasing after them. And they're stuck now with this big sea right in front of them. This wasn't a creek or a river. It was a massive body of water. And there was nowhere to go. I'm sure they felt a little bit afraid. But you know what? When we have daring faith, we can be courageous. We can be brave. Even if what's going on around us is a little bit scary, we can still be brave. And Moses was. Moses listened to God and Moses did exactly what God told him to do. God told him to raise his staff and that he would literally part the sea so that the Israelites could walk across on dry land. But the Israelites had to have faith, daring faith. Now it's, it's kind of like this. So if I'm holding the rock, but I really want to pick up the helmet, I have a decision to make. Now as an astronaut, which is going to be more helpful to me, the rock or the helmet? Well, of course the helmet is. But to pick up the helmet, I'm gonna have to let go of the rock. So I'll let go of the rock so I can pick up the helmet. See, it's just like that. See, faith works the same way. You can't have faith and fear at the same time. You have to let one of them go so that you can have the other. So we can have daring faith, just like Moses, and we can put down the fear let go of the fear and take on faith and be courageous. And every one of us can be brave and have daring faith. Now, let's check in on Hank and Charlie and see what they're into this week. Here we go. What is this place? Can you hear my voice, Mr. Dash? Yes. You're joking me, hey? 
You're choking me! Stop it! Touch anything! If you're watching this, then something has gone horribly wrong with the mission. They hypnotized you? I think so. Wait, why'd they hypnotize you? Obviously to make me do something that I normally wouldn't want to do. I mean, it's not like we took a test or anything to tell who's smarter or whatever, because wait, I- Wait, wait, wait. Wait, are you, are you jealous that I got hypnotized and you didn't? I mean, it just would have been nice <gasps> if I could have had the option. Are you serious? Just trust me, listen, come here. I've got a need for speed. Okay. So why do I need all this stuff? Because you're gonna fix the radio. You're gonna fix the radio with just an Xbox? Yep. It's pretty genius, huh? Stop it. Just stop it. I'm sick of all your ideas. Hey, hey, I'm just thinking out loud. Okay? Besides, Grandma told me that my brain is about 13% faster than most people's. Grandma tells you that? Yes, all the time. Grandma crawls around with a bull on her back because she thinks she's a turtle. No, no, she does not, okay? She does that because she thinks she's part of the turtle family. They're very different. Mission control to launch craft one. Mission Control to Launchcraft 1. Come in, Launchcraft 1. Launchcraft 1, come in if you can hear me. I'm not getting a signal from any of their systems. Hey, throw me that controller, would you? Thanks. I wonder what Grandma's doing right now. <laughs> She's probably trying to like vacuum the ceiling or something. Before we left, I told Phil to come by the house and bring her some something to eat and some water. You told our neighbor to feed and water our grandma. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't want her to go hungry. How many times a day? Three. Yeah, that seems about right. I think I got it. Is it working yet? There's only one way to find out. Okay, so I think we can need to uh, hone in on their frequency. Oh, okay, okay. nine, four, nine, no. nine, Wait, 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 four. hold on. Slow down, slow down. Nine, four, nine, three, two, zero, eight, two, Five, seven, five, seven, four, five. Google? No, it's written right there on the side. Oh. <laughs> Why do you use Google anyways? I mean, it's like 40 years old and like Wikipedia is making this awesome comeback. Hey, I think I heard something. Hold on. I think I got him. Like Wikipedia is making this awesome comeback. What did he just say? I think he said Wikipedia. Can, can you hear me? Hello? I think there's a delay because of the distance, so let's just be patient, okay? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, mission control copy that, Roger. L listen to me, do not proceed with the plan. You are in the orbit of the first moon. Do not proceed, I repeat. I think they want us to proceed with the mission? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, um, copy that, Roger. Uh, uh, mission Control, we will proceed with the mission. No, 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 do not proceed. You are in the orbit of our moon. Uh, we just have one uh, small, small problem. We're not sure what to do next. Over, over and out. Ah! What was that? I think we just lost the radio. We lost him.
I think they want us to do it. Oh man, well, at least we found that button. But you know what this means, man? That's the kaboom button. If the ship goes kaboom, we go kaboom. Stop messing with this thing, man. Come on, give that back. How do you, but you bring it anyway. I didn't bring it, I found it in her stuff. Hey, isn't that that lady? <gasps> yes, I told you it was that lady. Wait, 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 back go up. back, go back. I can't see go anything, back. man. Look, go back. I, your big head is in the way. I need you to listen closely. There's an escape pod attached to the shuttle. They didn't mean for it to be used. But it may be your only option. Stop. If the detonation sequence is initiated, you may not have time to get off of the ship. You're blocking pushing me. Pushing my hand away. You have huh? to move quickly. I can't see the screen. Yeah, but stop. stop. Stop pushing Doing. my hand away. What the heck, man? Stop. That was so close. <laughs> that would have been so bad. <laughs> I hope you had a great time learning about Moses and how he had daring faith. They had daring faith because they chose to be brave even when they were feeling fearful. Just like Moses and the Israelites, we can choose to have daring faith by choosing to be brave even when we are feeling scared or maybe stressed. Remember, God promises to always be with us. He will give us the strength to be brave, regardless of the situation we may be facing. Thanks for joining us today on CC Kids Live. Bye. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. So glad that you guys are tuning in to CC Live as we dive into our second week into what we're talking about of Go and Make. So I'm really excited as we get through these stories of parables in Matthew to talk about disciples. And so last week we talked about planting seeds and how important it is to have a good foundation in your faith so that when you go through the ups and downs of life, you have faith to fall back on. And so at the end, I touched a little bit on what it means to plant seeds. And in that, we were talking about how to plant seeds on different ground and what that means and the metaphors in the parables. You see, when you share your faith with someone, a stranger or a friend, you might never get to see that relationship grow into a faith journey. You may never even get a glimpse at it. And so today I want to talk more about that garden. I want to talk more about what it should look like and what it might look like for your life. So if you can, open your Bibles with me to Matthew 13. Uh, and we want to look at a story of a parable that's super important. And so it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed in which a, a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. I think that in this story of the Bible, in this parable, it's one of my favorites. It's very short, but super important. Because Jesus often had an audience for his parables and metaphors. And that audience was typically filled with people of religious authorities and people of commoners, of general people. And so in this, Jesus is comparing God's kingdom to something as tiny as a mustard seed. And it probably sounded outrageous to anyone who was actually sitting there with the Jewish religious text. But God, this almighty creator, the one who saved the Israelites from Egypt, the God of Elijah and Elisha, the God who brought down the walls of Jericho and his kingdom was the size of a mustard seed? In the words of Azini from The Princess Bride, inconceivable. I didn't do that right. But that's how the Jews would have viewed it in this case. And they had heard stories of God who they believed was sending them a conqueror. 
someone that, that was bigger than life to bring about the kingdom. And here, Jesus, who is saying he's God and telling them that God's kingdom is the size of a mustard seed. Super, super small. But Jesus, he goes on to see, say that a man took that seed and planted it in his field. And this man is the church. And the church planted these mustard seeds. And even though the seeds were small, even though they didn't seem near the size the kingdom of the Almighty God should be, The seeds grew larger than life. They grew to be garden plants, become trees. You see, constantly around us, we're always planting seeds. In every conversation, in every conversation, we're planting seeds around us. And I've heard so that you might be the only, uh, that that there might be this part of the Bible that makes sure that it reflects Christ's love. I think it's true. Because if you live radically for the gospel, people can tell. And if you're someone who proclaims the gospel with your mouth, but not with your actions, people can see the hypocrite that you are. And so if we're always planting seeds, even if these seeds seem super small and meaningless, the kingdom of heaven grows a great deal because of the effort that you're making. And in this, there's a second parable there, too, that I think is a very interesting way of looking of the kingdom of heaven. And this falls into Matthew 13, 33, and we read this part. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour. And into it, it worked all throughout the dough. You see, if you ever made bread, uh, I love a good zucchini bread, if anybody, you know has some zucchinis they could give me. But anyways, you know that one of the most vital, important steps in making bread is giving time for the yeast to rise. If you don't give time for that yeast to rise, you'll end up with communion wafers, like the things we get in our communion, super small. You see, yeast is a fungus fungus that is alive when you make bread, and without getting it into the chemistry of it, yeast releases these things of enzymes into the dough that causes it to rise, and this is what makes bread fluffy when you cook it i like fluffy bread (laughs) and so these two metaphors these two parables that jesus talks to might not seem to have much in common at the first glance but when you relate to farming and baking of things of the time the core jesus is talking about growth you see jesus wants to see his kingdom grow and he wants you to be a part of that growth not only being a participant being but also growing it You see, he calls the church to facilitate that growth by planting seeds or by mixing yeast into flour. And even if planting seeds and mixing yeast seems small and inconsequential, the truth truth is all those small things add up over time. And so as we go and make as uh, disciples, we have to do the small things, the little things that it takes. For you and for me, it might look different. And so that's what's great is we get to have a chance to talk more about this uh, in the coming weeks. All right. See you guys soon. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt your conversation, but listen, don't worry. I'll let you finish as soon as possible. Thank you for joining us today. I just want to take a break and for a minute and help 
uh, you prepare for today's service. If you haven't already, go ahead and open the Bible app and under events, search for Christ Church Mason. And once you're there, scroll down to CC Live Experiences right there. You find the information you need to follow today's online gathering. This experience was made with you in mind. So together we can experience God and connect with each other through technology all at the same time. Now, go ahead, jump back into that conversation with each other and get ready to worship together. Remember, this is CC Live Community Begins right here. Join us now for the CC Live Experience, where community begins now.
everyone what an amazing song you just heard i hope you're already all geared up to join this message you're so glad we got to learn together but better than that we're going to learn by sharing our own experiences our own story we all have our own journey and now we get the opportunity to use our own story our own experiences to add to our learning with each other so get ready we're going to ask questions we're going to answer together uh, if you're watching by yourself you're not alone we got a ton of people with you in the chat room and you can be part of the conversation as well for those of you gather in a, all our house campuses uh, welcome to cc live and make the most out of it join the conversation uh, uh and be be in community enjoy the community the time we're going to spend together today after the message i'll be back here and we're going to share communion together. We're going to give together. We're going to learn about ways that we can continue to make an impact in God's kingdom through technology. Remember, we'll, we're first going to jump in the word right here, right now. So let's do this right now together. This is CC Live. Community begins right here. <laughs> Well, hey there, CC Live. So excited. Week two of our series simply titled The Comeback. And I want to welcome all of you that are at the Monkey Bar, all of you at our online campus. I'm so glad you guys are with us. In fact, uh, I, want to, I want to remind us of our strategy here at Christ Church. Pray, invite, engage. Uh, that's what our PI strategy stands for. We're going to pray for one. We're going to invite one. We're going to engage one. And in fact, what we're going to talk about today is actually central to our strategy. But before we get to that, uh, I want you to think about the deepest relationships that you have. Uh, I've mentioned numerous times uh, to our church, I'm a part of this mentor group uh, of guys. And if you're not familiar, there's going to be a photo on the screen, and you're going to see the guys that, that I do life with. In fact, there's seven of us, and um, this group of seven of us, we take time twice a year, and we get together, and, and we meet. And we're all pastors, and, and one of the guys that you see in the middle of that, kind of the older-looking guy in there, he, he would laugh if he heard us say that, um, but is Cal Jernigan. He's a pastor at a church in, in Phoenix. And we've met twice a year now for almost nine years. And there's nothing that we don't know about each other. But there is nothing off limits. There's nothing we can't speak about to one another. It is a deep relationship that we have. We have deep conversations with one another. We, we don't just meet twice a year at a friend's cabin either. We, we're constantly talking and texting and FaceTiming and visiting each other and encouraging and spurring one another on. But that's not how it started. In fact, that's not how it started at all. In fact, I want to show you another picture you'll see on the screen year one, and there was only four of us at that time. It was, it, it was myself that you see in that photo. It was Cal who was leading the front. Um, it was my friend Sean Moyers. He's the guy without any hair uh, who's in Colorado at a great church in Colorado, um, and Scott Beckenhauer. 
uh, who's in that photo, who's a pastor in Nebraska. And it's interesting because I'll never forget the first night that we were together. We were in Colorado. Uh, we were at this place called Blessing Ranch, which is, uh, it has now since moved to Florida because of the fires that happened in Colorado a few years ago. And we're sitting in this, in this house on this property in Colorado. Uh, and none of us, we all knew of each other. We just didn't really know each other. You ever been in one of those instances? And I, I knew of Sean, but I didn't know Sean. I knew of Scott, but I didn't know Scott. We, we all knew Cal, but Cal started this session that was honestly kind of awkward when we first got together. And, and we didn't really know what Cal was going to want out of this either. Like, why would a guy like Cal want to spend time with guys like us? And then he said this to us, and I'll never forget this. He said, guys, this group will only be as deep as we're willing to share with each other. And, and he said, if you want a surface level relationship and everything is great, nothing is a struggle group, then don't share the real stuff. And, and then he said this, he goes, if that's what you want, I can't lead that because I don't have time to give my time to surface level relationships. But he said, however, if you guys want depth, love, care, accountability, truth, and love, I'm in. And then he goes, so who wants to share first? And it was this interesting moment because one by one, we begin, the three of us with Cal, and him included, he didn't hold anything back either, begin to share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our lives. And it was scary. It was, it was one of those moments like you're exposing your soul to people that you've just met. I just had dinner with these guys and now I'm exposing my soul to them. And here's what's interesting. Each one of us, including Cal, we had stuff. In fact, we still have stuff. It's, it's seven now in the group, seven pastors. When we get together, we've got stuff. We've got issues. We're dealing with things we never thought we would deal with in the church, but we know about it. In fact, the next morning, I'll never forget, we got up and actually a couple of us, we, we actually slept in pretty hard. It was first good night's sleep a couple of the guys had had in a long time. But we got up and we sat around the kitchen table together. And we all kind of expressed this regret and this buyer's remorse of what we shared the night before. Like, what if these guys used the info that I gave them against me? Or, or what if these guys posted on social media? Or what, what if they thought my stuff was too much and now they don't want me here? And we were all thinking the same thing. Yet, the reason those relationships are the best ones that I have today is not because of the fun and laughter that we have, which we have a lot of. It's, it's sheer hilarity and pandemonium when we get together sometimes. But that's not why. It's the depth of conversations we have to deepen our relationships with one another. There is nobody... Short of my family, there is nobody outside of my family that knows Trevor DeVage like those seven guys. And I would say vice versa. And I want you to write something down, and I'm going to ask you a question as we get started today. And it's just simply this. Honest conversations lead to deep relationships. Honest conversations lead to deep relationships. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to, to if you're at the Monkey Bar, if you're at a house campus, or, or if you're online, do this in the chat room. Uh, but I want you to discuss this for the next few moments. It's so just simply this. Who do you have in your life that you have deep and honest relationship with? Who do you have in your life that you have deep and honest relationship with? And you may be thinking, I don't have anybody. I want you to share that. And if you do, I want you to share that. So take a few minutes, discuss that, and we'll be back in just a moment.
So I, I don't know how you answer that, but I do wonder about you today if you've experienced a depth of relationship where you felt safe, you felt secure, you felt encouraged, you felt sharpened and free. I just wonder if you've really experienced that. And my prayer is that if you don't have that relationship in your life, that you would actually find it. But I think there's something that we all need. We need others. We need a place to be fully us and fully loved because we're fully us. A place where we can talk and listen and and be sharpened and find peace and find truth with love, like we talked about last week. In fact, last week we talked about the, the coming back to truth as the body of Christ and as Christ's followers. And, and I, I want to give us a truth that we need to come back to today that is the body of Christ. Because if we don't tell the truth on the forefront, then the rest of the comeback doesn't make any, any sense. But the, the truth of this is, is that the, the body of Christ, the church, individuals, we need to come back to the first word of our strategy here at Christ Church, and it's this word prayer. It's the word prayer. Now, I know you hear that, and some of you, you think, well, that means knees bowed, hands folded, eyes closed, right? You you think it's thanking God for food and safe travels, and for us not to fail a test maybe we haven't studied for. But but I want to say this as we start, and I'm going to hit this again at the end, but if we want to change the world, if we want to change our community, if we want to change our marriages, our kids, our future, and our present... The foundation is truth, but it starts with honest, bold, and persistent prayers. That's where it starts. And I know, prayer comes with a lot of baggage. Yet, here's the truth as Christ followers, and I want you to write this down today. We will only go as far as our prayer life takes us. I've actually heard it said, uh, if you were to actually have God answer the prayers that you prayed yesterday, what would change in your world today? Would people be healed? If God were to answer every prayer you prayed yesterday, would people be healed? Uh, Would people be provided for? Uh, Like those kind of things. What are we praying? How are we praying? And are we persistent in our prayers? And some of you, I know you have these amazing prayer lives. And it's evident. You know how I know? The fruit of your life. I know people that pray for everything and everyone that they can. And it's evident that you've spent time with Jesus. They simply know Jesus in a way that others don't. And then there are others of us that have prayed or been around a prayer. You know, maybe we pray at, at meals or, or bedtime, or maybe we pray for travel, like, God, keep me safe, or maybe we, we might throw up some good vibes or a quick prayer for someone on social media when they ask for it. By the way, the world doesn't need more good vibes or good thoughts. The world needs more intercessors that are going to enter into the throne room of God on the behalf of others and fight to snatch them from the flames of judgment. That's what we need. And yet the depth with Jesus in our prayers tends to be pretty surface level. So before we dive into the scripture, I want to ask you another question. I want you to take a few moments. I want you to, to reflect and answer this question. But what is your greatest challenge in prayer? What is your greatest challenge in prayer? Maybe it's, maybe it's actually praying. Maybe it's, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. Uh, will God even hear my prayers? What is your greatest challenge when it comes to prayer? Get real honest with the people around you right now, and we'll be back in just a few moments.
So let's take that now and let's jump into the scriptures and, and, and see what Jesus really wants for us. Uh, because there's some truth about prayer and, and why and how we need to come back to it that I think we have got to unpack for just a few moments uh, today. But I want to start with James chapter 1. So if you got Bibles, go over to James chapter 1. It's after the Gospels, it's after Acts, it's after Romans. It's about, I don't know, about two-thirds of the way through the New Testament. And let's hop into verse 5. Here's what it says. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he'll give it to you. Isn't that interesting? It says, ask our generous God, he'll give it to you. We'll come back to that. It says, he will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything they do. So right out of the gate, we need to understand something. God longs to be generous to you and me. Like, I want you to understand, God longs to be generous to you. He longs to be generous to me. He wants to give us the things we need and even some of the things we want. He longs to do that. And a lot of times we think that maybe he's going to smite us for asking, right? Or maybe he's like uh, the the almighty, powerful Oz that uh, instead of a loving father. But he longs to be generous. Now there's a caveat that James gives. And and he says this, don't have two loyalties. I don't know if you caught that. He says, don't have two loyalties. Now I know, I don't know about you, but I've spent a good part of my life, even as a Christ follower, thinking that I can have a loyalty to God and some loyalty to the world. Can I just tell you, it doesn't work. I'm either completely loyal to God or I'm completely loyal to the world. I'm only fooling myself if I think I can have both. And honestly, so are you. We do it all the time. And it's interesting, though. uh, Think think about this in any other relationship context that you have. In fact, uh, you you can't, let let me frame it to you this way. You can't be loyal to your spouse part of the time and at work. I mean, just, just think about it. You come home tomorrow, just hypothetical. You come home tomorrow and you say to your spouse, you're like, here's the deal. I love you. I love you. And I'm going to be loyal to you and you alone for four days a week. I'm going to give you the majority of the week. I'm going to be loyal to you. Now, the other three days, I'm going to be loyal to someone else. But for these four days, I'm going to be loyal to you. Let me know how that works out for you because I don't think it's going to work. That's going to go over like a lead balloon in your house. I would not suggest that. That is not good marital advice to go home and try. Yet what's interesting is, is we do that with God all the time. We ask him for wisdom, we ask him for our needs, we ask him for our wants, yet we only do it when we want something, not because we have deep relationship with him or deep loyalty to him. And here's where the baseline starts. The baseline with God, you need to understand, God longs to be generous to you. He wants to be generous to his children. He wants to answer and give good gifts to you. Because remember, answered prayers start with loyal relationship. In fact, write that down. Answered prayers start with a loyal relationship. Like, what if I told you that the key to your faith going deeper and stronger was learning how to pray effectively? Like, what if I told you that? Like, if I told you that your your relationship with Jesus, your faith going deeper, your faith going stronger was learning to pray effectively, how many of us would want to have a better and deeper prayer relationship with Christ. I'm guessing all of us. If you go over to Matthew chapter 7, actually Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, actually in my Bible, I don't know what it says in yours, in my Bible literally the heading says effective prayer. And it's Jesus teaching. Jesus teaching on effective prayer. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, he says this, Jesus says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks does what? What's it say? It says receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. In verse 9, he says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or, or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not, he says. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Uh, So it's interesting, our prayer lives are actually a better barometer of our belief in this text than actually our confession. Like, don't miss that. Our prayer lives are a better barometer of our belief than our confession of our sin. So do you believe that God is a good Father? 
Like, do you really believe God is a good father? Then you will pray. If you believe God is a good father, then you will pray. And and certainly no human father, Jesus says, would trick their children with crazy things like, I'm going to give you a rock instead of a roll and see what happens. Or I'm going to give you a snake instead of a fish. By the way, if somebody gave me a snake instead of a fish, I I would punch them. And I definitely wouldn't trust them or be loyal to them, right? Yet God is comparable to this perfectly loving father, by the way, which is a concept that was actually pretty foreign in Jewish prayers. But if you look in Isaiah 49, 15, God's compared to a caring mother. It says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, says the word of God, I will not forget you. So there's several things that this implies that Jesus teaches in the scripture uh, about why we should come back to prayer, why we really should hit our face, why we should be loyal to God. And the first one is this, he wants to give good gifts. He wants to give good gifts. If you're a parent, you understand this. I I have two daughters, my daughter Ella, my daughter Natalie. Like, I want to give my girls good gifts. I want to give them the desires of their heart. I I I want to be able to give them the things that bring the most joy to them. Like, I'll never forget last Christmas. For years, our girls have been asking for a piano. They want a piano. They want a piano. My girls are super musical, super talented. And I'm like, we're not buying a new piano. Let's not buy a piano because that's not going to stick, and they'll be on to something else. Uh, But we found a used piano for a really good price, and uh, they went to Illinois for a couple days, and uh, we had it snuck into the house, and they came back from Illinois right before Christmas. I put a big, like one of those big bows, you know what I'm talking about, the ones you see on cars on TV? I put a big bow on top of the piano, and they came home, and man, they lit up. Can I just tell you, there's not a day in our house that that piano is not being played. And every time it's played, I'm reminded, as a dad, the joy that a good gift brings to my daughter. Like, God wants to give us good gifts, and the only way that we experience that is if we actually ask the Father for the things that we desire him to do. Which leads to the second thing, is that we can approach him personally and persistently. Like my daughters, I'll just keep using them as an example. My daughter, Natalie, she's a persistent kid. But she also has a personal relationship with her dad. She will come to me and she's like, hey dad, uh, I I know maybe there's some things here and some things this, but uh, is it possible? So right now, she's persistent with something in our life. My my daughter, Natalie, she's 14, she wants a rabbit as a pet. She's always wanted a pet. We got her fish. She was like, Dad, I can't hold a fish. I can't pet a fish. I'm like, well, you technically you could, but uh, it doesn't go well for the fish. But, uh, but she's like, like Dad, I, I want something. I can. She's been researching rabbits online. And, and, and so my, my daughter's on Instagram, and I kid you not, it's probably uh, 10 times a day we get reels directly sent to my wife and I on Instagram that are just Instagram videos of bunnies and why they're cute and why we should have one and why they're the most adorable thing on the planet. And then she found out that Joey on our staff has a rabbit and she's like, dad, you got to talk to Joey. So every day for the last two months, dad, have you talked to Joey? Dad, can we get a rabbit? Dad, have you talked to Joey? Dad, can we get a rabbit? Dad, uh, here's another video. And I'm like, oh my gosh, child, to to the point, I actually kind of want to give her the rabbit. Like she's persistent. And she's knocking on the door. She's asking. She's seeking. She's like, Dad, you're my father. Don't you love me? Oh, great father of mine. Oh, great mother. Like, she's pulled out every stop. She she put together a presentation. No joke. A PowerPoint presentation on why we should have a rabbit. That's how persistent she is. And I got to be honest with you. I love it because that's what Jesus says. We should come to the door and ask. Now, here's the third piece that Jesus gives that. If we ask for something that is harmful, or if we ask for something with selfish motives, or or without faith, like we talked about in James 1 a little bit ago, God is not bound like some genie. He's not the genie from Aladdin that's going to come out of the bottle to grant our every request. That is not what prayer is about. He will grant our request if he deems it best. And here's what you need to hear. Sometimes God's answer is absolutely yes. There's times my daughter asks for things, and I'm like, absolutely yes. There's sometimes that God's going to look at us and go, I appreciate you asking, but the answer is no. There's times my girls come to me, and they, they, they really, they want something, and I'm like, I can see that's not the right thing, and the answer, no, I'm sorry, no, baby, that's not going to happen. And then sometimes God's answer is wait, like the rabbit. Right now, with the rabbit, we, we could have gone and bought one like two months ago, but we've kind of been like, okay, time, it's not no, it's not yes, it's wait, we got to do some research 
And I've even used the words, if you're a parent, you've probably done this too. If you keep pestering me, the answer is going to be no. The good news is God doesn't do that. If God says wait, he's asking us to wait for a reason. See, that's what persistent prayer looks like. And the effectiveness of prayer, it's a bit of a mystery. Because God is sovereign. His will is going to be accomplished. He already knows our needs. And so you may be sitting here thinking, well, then, then why should we imagine that our puny prayers would actually change anything? Think, why even pray? If God already knows the outcome, if God already knows what he's going to do, why would we pray? Well, honestly, our prayers can change a lot. And you're like, how do you know that, Trev? Because scripture actually says they do. I, I want to read you just a, a quick snippet of scripture. Because Moses has a prayer in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, that actually averts the wrath of God on the Israelites, actually changes God's mind. So let's just read it. Then the Lord said, I've seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Exodus 32, verse 9. Verse 10, he says, now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But Moses, I love this, Moses tried to pacify the Lord as good, his God. He said, why are you so angry with your own people who you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them uh, with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this. This terrible disaster you've threatened against your people. Remember your servants Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. And I will give, give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants. And they'll possess it forever. Listen to verse 14. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he'd threatened to bring onto his people. You may be thinking, how on earth was Moses able to change the mind of God? It wasn't a one-time conversation that did that, by the way. This wasn't Moses and God not knowing each other. Moses has an intimate relationship with God. He has a, an intimate conversation life with God. They talk on a regular basis. They have regular conversation. It's an intimacy. It's a depth that, that we have when we have real relationships. And I just want to remind us, answered prayers start with a loyal relationship. Moses has a loyal relationship with God. A loyal relationship. He had been through the thick of it. He wasn't perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. But he was in real life, daily communication with God. And as a result, this moment, he changes the mind of God. So I want to take another just another break for a moment. I want, you to, I want you to discuss this, and I want to ask you this question, and I, I want you to get really brass tacks honest with yourself and with others. Do you believe your prayers can change the mind of God? Why or why not? Do you believe your prayers can change the mind of God? Why or why not? Take a few moments to discuss. We'll be back in just a moment.
So I, I don't know how you answer that. Do you believe that your prayers can actually change the mind of God? Uh, but here's what I know, even for Moses, even for us, most often what has changed is not the mind of God, but it's the heart of man. When we have real, honest relationship with God, what changes usually is our heart, not God's mind. Because prayer often produces in us a perspective and a posture that enables us to receive God's intended blessing in our lives. See, we pray simply out of obedient faith, not because we have solved the paradox between God's sovereignty and effective prayer. See, once we get so aligned with the heart of God, it's easy to shift our hearts to the things that make his heart beat. I mean, that's what we're really looking for. When you get into such a depth of relationship with God, that your heart beats for the things that beat God's heart, when your heart breaks for the things that break the heart of God, those are the moments that effective prayer is taking place. When we have a relationship with God in a way that is loyal and real and authentic, not about us and what we can get, but about the things that are the things he's about, that's when we can come back to the truth that prayer really does change things. That prayer really does change things. Can I be honest with you? For most of my years as a Christ follower, prayer has been diminished in the church. It's true. I don't know about in your life, but just think about it in your own life for a minute. It's something maybe you did before meals. Maybe before bedtime, you you folded your hands. God is great. God is good, right? Uh, Every meal, when I was a kid, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. It was instilling prayer in me, but the problem was it was the same prayer all the time. And we never prayed for anything other than God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Or in church, we we pray before communion, we pray before offering. It's a placeholder, it's a transition. And it's been for a transaction with God for some of us and not a transformation through God. And the thing we have to come back to as a people, as a church, as Christians, is this. And we said it at the front. If you want to change the world, you want to change our community, you want to change our marriages, you want to change our kids, our our futures and our present, it's going to start with honest, bold, and persistent prayers to God. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but but how do I pray? Well, let me ask you this. How do you have conversations with other people? Like real practically speaking, before we wrap up today, don't overcomplicate prayer. I think we've overcomplicated that you gotta, you got to fold your hands, you got to bow your head, you got to close your eyes, you got to get on your knees. All those things are fine. But honestly, some of the best prayer moments I've ever had are just sitting in my office or driving down the road or on a walk, literally audibly out loud saying, God, I don't know what to do right now. God, I need your wisdom right now. God, I, 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 I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shut up after I tell you what I'm going through and, and talk to you for a minute, and then I'm just gonna listen for what you want me to do. And you know what's interesting? When I'm real authentic in my prayer life, when I'm just real honest, when I'm that blunt, that honest, when I, when I'm sitting in a chair, when I'm sitting in my office, when I'm walking down the street, when I'm driving in my car, uh, man, I'll be honest with you. There's been moments where I, I've been playing golf. I just maybe some like Sunday afternoon. Sometimes I'll just go walk nine holes by myself in the evening. And, and sometimes the most clearing moments of my life come while walking by myself, talking to God. I, I'll be honest. Last week, I, I went out and I. I literally, I, I, I literally just strapped on my golf bag, and I think it was like Saturday evening. And I just started walking down the fairway, and I, I, was, I was just struggling. Struggling with some stuff in my heart and my mind, trying to figure some things out. And I just began to pray. It was just me. Just God. I was like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. God, I don't know what you want me to be right now, how you want me to handle this, what, what, are you, what are you calling me to in this moment? And I just walked. And I said, God, I'm just going to listen. So I just shut up. You know what's interesting? God began to press things into my heart and things began to come to my mind and then people begin to send me text messages randomly. You ever have that happen? You pray for something and then you get a random text message and you're like, hmm, that's interesting. But it's only in the moments where we're willing to go to the level of depth. You've got to be honest with yourself and be honest with God. And once you get honest like that, I think that's when we begin to see real, true relationship and prayer with God take place.
Communion with Christ cannot be restricted to a personal experience. It is a community meal. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 teaches that the unity of the bread symbolizes the unity that Christ has desired to work out in us. In truth, this is why he died, so that he would make Jews or and Gentiles, slaves and free, strong and weak, rich and poor, one in Christ. Jesus prayed this in John 17. He gave his spirit to effect this among his people. And he gave his supper as a practical means to remind local churches of their unity in Christ. As you take the Lord's Supper today, remember, your portion is not just, just a handcrafted for you. It comes from one loaf and one cup. Christ died to unite a fractured humanity into a new man. And so, we eat a meal that not only proclaims the death of Jesus, it also announces what that death accomplished. The creation of a new community that defines itself by the Lord it loves and the meals it eats. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much because of the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ did on the cross for each one of us. We can be here today. So we come together as one church. We know that we do this individually, but we come as one community. And here in this platform, we come as one global community with our house campuses there in, in uh, Africa, in 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 Pakistan and here, right in our backyard, the church, the bar, and even in Oklahoma. All these locations represent one church, united this moment, taking communion together. So bless this time we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. CC Live is an online global community of Christ's Church in Mason, Ohio. By partnering with us, you are empowering and enabling not only international, but local outreach. Your financial support helps us impact people across the globe, across the country, but even across the street. The Bible calls us to be generous with what we have been given. Giving back to God reflects a grateful heart that wants to return back to God a portion of what He has given to us. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and is a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ's Church, there are three easy ways to give. Scan the QR code on the screen right now you can text CC Mason to 77977 and click on the link you receive. You can also find the link to give by going to our website, ourchristschurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Thank you for partnering with us. Together community begins here. Well, hey everyone, what a great service we had. So glad to, to always worship here live on Sundays together with you. We had this great conversations, great message, uh, and another opportunity to grow together in community. Uh, remember, we, we want to do something this week. We want to take an assessment. Assessments is a great way for us, the church, know better ways to minister to you and to integrate you better into this community we call church. 
So it only takes five minutes and we're gonna share this QR code just to use your mobile device to scan. We're gonna give you different ways to do that in the chat room uh, also. So just stay tuned, you can uh, send a, a text message to get a link. There's different ways for you to access, but at the end of the day, only five minutes. And remember, you only have five days to do this assessment. So just take advantage, do it right now. We wanted to learn from you. And this is an opportunity for us to do that. So take your uh, life assessment. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be great. It's gonna help us a ton. And we're gonna get better doing what we do as a church. We had a great experience today and I cannot wait to do this again next week. Meanwhile, we wanna connect with you. Make sure to go to our website, uh, ourchristchurch.com and all our social media outlets. We're ready to connect with you. This QR code right here, give you access to everything CC Live. Anything you have questions about, you can just scan here and you gain access. Uh, to me personally, you can connect with me as a pastor and talk to you about any questions you may have here about the church or about your spiritual life. We would love to connect with you. Until then, we'll be back here next Sunday, 5.50 a.m. Eastern Time to celebrate all that God's doing to us throughout the week. Until then, have a blessed week. This is CC Live Community Begins right here. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God